This morning, uh, we're going to be talking about a very explosive topic. In fact, this slide's probably the only one that's got any humor in it at all. Uh, we're going to be talking about the inclusion of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer questioning people in the church. And to keep it a little bit brief, Rob, I'm going to be using the acronym LGBTQ. Uh, the reason this topic is so important now is that the, the United Methodist Church is on the precipice of great change as it considers the full inclusion of LGBTQ members. Now, our gospel reading this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. And you can find it on pages 894 in your uh, Pew Bible. Uh, or on page 1137 in the large print Bible. Uh, in other passages, Jesus talks about adultery and divorce, uh, but this story is remarkable in that it depicts Jesus being questioned about the law of Moses and judgment. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst. They said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This, they said, to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger in the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they, they uh, went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on sin no more. This is the word of God for the people of God. In our gospel lesson, our first thought is, this is a test. We know that the Pharisees and the scribes were trying to catch Jesus so they could bring charges against him. In the law of Moses, adulterers were to be executed. But they suspected that Jesus might be merciful. They figured they had him either way. If Jesus upheld the, the, uh, the law, he could be turned over to Pilate. And that's because under Roman uh, uh, occupation, only Pilate could carry out executions. If he showed mercy to the young woman, Jesus would be discredited for not upholding the law. So Jesus thinks about it and then shows remarkable wisdom and resolution. We take from this story a lesson in humility and that we should be slow to make judgments on others. Now, one thing in the story that uh, should be noted, Jesus did not answer the Pharisees right away. He stooped down and began to write in the dirt. We don't know what he wrote, uh, so he probably wasn't important. What it was important to the story is that Jesus took his time to answer the accusers. Sometimes the most emotional conflicts that we face take time. Now the question which the United Methodist Church has wrestled with for the last half century is, can LGBTQ people be full members of the United Methodist Church? Can they participate in the ordained leadership of the church and be wedded in the church? The answer is yes and no. In the Book of Discipline, Article 4 states, that all persons, all persons are of sacred worth. All persons without regard to race, color, national origin, status, or economic condition shall be eligible to attend its worship services, participate in its programs, 
receive the sacraments, and upon baptism be admitted as baptized members, and upon taking vows, declaring that the Christian faith become professing members in any local church in the connection. Now, while there's no exclusion of LGBTQ people in membership, there are restrictions in ordination and marriage in the church. The United Methodist Church stipulated policies on ordination in 1972 in anticipating, anticipation of the emerging gay liberation movement. Our current book of discipline states, the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. Therefore, self-avowed practicing homosexuals are not to be certified as candidates ordained as ministers or appointed to serve in the United Methodist Church. It also states ceremonies that celebrate homosexual unions shall not be conducted by our ministers and shall not be conducted in our churches. Now, up until now, I've quoted the United Methodist Discipline and its use of the term homosexual. I'll now, I'll now refrain from using this terminology as this term can be very offensive to some. Up until 1973, homosexuality was seen as a mental illness. The diagnosis has been removed after professionals decided that homosexuality was not a mental illness, but a sexual orientation. Homosexuality also infers a, a sexual behavior rather than a human identity. So for the remainder of this talk, I'll be used terms uh, gay, lesbian, or LGBTQ. I'll also use the term marriage for same-sex couples instead of gay marriage or same-sex marriage. Now, at every general conference since 1972, petitions to change the discipline have been offered and rejected. The, the language has grown pretty heated and tumultuous lately, uh, especially in 2012 when progressive representatives disrupted the general conference in protest. At the 2016 United Methodist General Conference, delegates approved a recommendation to create a commission on a way forward, which would analyze the church's stance on LGBTQ issues. This special commission, named by the Council of Bishops, is currently meeting in order to develop a complete examination and possible revision of every paragraph in the Book of Discipline regarding human sexuality. Tom Berlin, uh, an elder and representative on the commission, described the challenges to the church in a presentation that uh, I'm gonna borrow from. Basically, in the United States church, uh, Methodists can be seen as composed of traditionalists and progressives. Uh, these groups are either for or against LGBTQ inclusion, and then further divided into groups of compatibilists and non-compatibilists. Now, a compatibilist is a person who feels that they can coexist with people who believe differently than they do. A non-compatibilist is not comfortable with other views. Now, the little packs of sugar that you see uh, represent people of the church. Each, each grain of sugar is a member and is affected by the, the debate at hand. The Book of Discipline, that's our rule book, and that's what keeps us connected one to another. Now, from right to left, uh, the traditional compatibil non-compatibilists are people who are satisfied with the current restrictive wording of the Book of Discipline on marriage and the ordination of openly gay people. They want to see the church live out what they feel are obvious prohibitions in Scripture. Their concerns about change are of such importance to them that they would rather be in a church where they all agree on these matters than feel personally compromised by a church with a diverse view on human identity. Uh, right next to them is the traditionalist compatibilist. Um, they hold traditional views on human identity, but understand that other pastors or churches would like to have the option of offering marriage ceremonies for same-sex couples. Some annual conferences want to have the ability to ordain people who are openly gay. While they do not want to be forced to performing uh, 
such a marriage, they can live in a denomination where this occurs. Next, progressive uh, compatibilists like to see the church offer ordination to all people in marriage to any committed Christian couple. They understand that traditionalist friends are not where they are, and they believe that the unity Christ prayed for the church can be upheld despite this difference. They respect the right of their traditionalist friends and do not want them to be forced into situations that would violate their personal beliefs. On the far left uh, are the progressive non-compatibilists. They have deep concerns for the call of justice and Jesus' care of the marginalized. These two points of biblical interpretation, among others, lead them to work for full inclusion in the life of the church. Now this is such a high value uh, item for them that they only want to be in a church that reflects this belief and will work for change as long as the church does not. Now in recent years, progressives have violated the book of discipline in protest. Clergy have performed marriages for same-sex couples. Conferences have ordained people who are openly gay. Progressives see these as acts of civil disobedience that will lead to greater justice and mercy. When changes have been brought against clergy who have performed these ceremonies, there has been a wide variance in the consequences. And one of the key frustrations for traditionalists is that the decision to perform marriages for same-sex couples has consequences in their lives. People in their church leave. People in Oklahoma may leave their church because of a wedding performed by a UMC pastor in Maine. Losing members is a painful event in the life of the church, and traditionalists are frustrated that this is the consequences they bear for keeping the book of discipline. Traditionalist compatibilists find that their members uh, are, who are often more ideologically diverse on these two issues also leave. And that's equally painful uh, when it occurs, even though it's less likely to happen in these congregations. Now one reaction uh, to this is to propose changes to the wording of the Book of Discipline to create definitive consequences for these acts of disobedience. An example was legislation at the 2016 General Conference that would have required bishops to give clergy who performed a wedding for a same-sex couple one year of unpaid leave. A second offense would lead to the surrender of their credentials. The Judicial Council of the United Methodist Church did not allow this rule to go through. Progressive non-compatibilists argue that they are also facing consequences to the lack of change in the Book of Discipline. Uh, the work they've done for justice in this area uh, has not had any impact on the Book of Discipline, and they are also losing members who are discouraged by this lack of progress. Because the, the Book of Discipline has not changed, progressive compatibilists are losing members as well. The difficulty of being a centrist in this conversation, no matter whether you lean uh, left or right, is that people always seem to be disappointed in you or in the church. Now this would be a small matter, except that it involves people. The people who are leaving are members of the church, whether they're straight or not. So the commission on a way forward was formed to talk about these difficult things and figure out how we can live together or separately from one another. The commission is composed of 35 people from the breadth and scope of the United Methodist Church, male and female, ordained in laity, gay and straight, from the United States and abroad. The commission's vision is to design a way for being church that maximizes the presence of the United Methodist Church witness in as many places in the world as possible while balancing different theological understandings of human identity. The Commission will look at new forms and structures of relationship and to the complete examination and, and possible revision of relevant paragraphs in the Book of Discipline. They will give recommendations to refine our present connection, which is showing signs of brokenness. 
Now, just this last Tuesday, the commission put out a progress report. And I'll go over some of the highlights uh, from that report, which can be found on the UMC website on the news and media page in, in full. Now, the, the commission says that in our current setting, the way forward cannot be an extension of our path of conflict. In other words, they feel that they cannot continue to fight it out. To do so, the commission had to question their own assumptions about polity and structure. They found that by exercising some freedom of thought, the commission is getting very creative thinking of possible options for the church. The concerns and goals relate uh, related to human sexuality vary widely across the globe due to cultural, civic, and legal restrictions. Some changes within the U.S. church may pose a potential threat to the vital mission of our central conferences. So understanding and honoring those nuances of each central conference is critical in their, uh, in their work. The commission is working towards a looser structure uh, while tightening the essentials of United Methodist theology and doctrine. That means honoring the, uh, the differences in practices uh, and the non-essentials for the sake of the mission. A as a result, we may end up seeing a, a simpler structure and a thinner book of discipline. This is going to be essential if we're going to remain in mission. So the commission is looking at uh, many creative ways of living together, including branches, umbrella plans, affiliated connections, federated relationships, and more. The commission's work suggests that a new church uh, will not look like our current church. It will have a common theological center, but may be dynamic and flexible in connection. It may mean a way for groups to be in ministry separately while sharing some common ministry. The hope is that this will enable people with contradictory convictions to flourish. It may also mean multiple editions or versions of the Book of Discipline. Now the Commission's got five more meetings to complete, two of which prior to the November meeting of the Council of Bishops. Now, once the commission makes its final recommendations, a special session of the General Conference will take place in February 2019 in St. Louis. So what does that leave us on the local level? Well, regardless of what the church does in a broader uh, hierarchy, we still have to be church. Last Sunday, Pastor Jim talked about the importance of Christian worship and the need to keep our focus on Jesus Christ. It's a foundation of our Christian walk. It's the most critical thing we do as sisters and brothers in Christ. Pastor Jim also told us, the devil will always make sure there's a reason not to worship. I'm convinced that Satan is the only one who benefits from our infighting. It has distracted us for making disciples of Christ. Why should we help Satan disrupt our community? Community is important because that's where worship takes place. The church wins only when we worship Jesus together, straight and non-straight. In order to heal the wounds of our church and repair the fissures in our denomination, we need to repair the harm done in our communities. We need to build bridges between both sides. In the book, Building a Bridge, James, uh, Father James Martin wisely describes the essential tools in which the church and the LGBT community need to employ to change their relationship. These are respect, compassion, and sensitivity, the foundation of all relationships. Starting with respect, the people of the church need to start acknowledging the existence of LGBTQ people in our community. They are part of our landscape, our workplace, and our church. 
Understand the proper LGBTQ terminology. For me, it was an eye-opening experience when I had to learn the terminology for this talk. I never knew language that I'd used day to day could be harmful or offensive. People want to be called by the names they choose to speak to their identity. No one likes labels that hurt or misinform. Recognize that LGBTQ people bring gifts to the church. Each person, straight or not, is given gifts from God to enable the making of disciples of Christ. Gay members have these gifts just like their straight counterparts. Next comes compassion. To begin with, compassion requires us to listen to the other person. We need to hear the calls for hope and those for help. It's not enough just to voice your opinion, but also to listen. God gave us a mouth we can close, but ears that we cannot close. Think about it. Having compassion for someone means you're willing to suffer with them. The LGBTQ community has more than their fair share of suffering. Their youth have four times the number of suicides as their straight counterparts. Eight times that number, eight times, if they come from a rejecting home. They suffer more hate crimes and face more bullying than any other group. Suffering with them means to stand by them. Fortunately, life isn't all suffering. To have true compassion, we do not treat people who aren't straight as objects of pity or, or a cause. We should have compassion enough to rejoice with them as well. Third, there is need to be sensitive. It's hard to be sensitive to someone if you really don't know them. Come to know your LGBTQ Christians as friends. There is no prohibition of LGBTQ people as members of the church, yet there's no awareness of them either except in highly progressive churches. Being sensitive, we are aware of how we treat people different from ourselves. Pope Francis, who's a great pope, uh, said in 2016, People must be accompanied, as Jesus accompanied. When a person who has a situation comes before Jesus, Jesus will surely not say, go away because you're homosexual. For a relationship to work, it has to be a two-way bridge. This may feel challenging or even painful, considering how LGBTQ people have been treated but progressives need to set aside the us versus them mentality and treat traditionalists with respect, compassion, and sensitivity as well. Beyond the respect for church hierarchy, we are all called to respect traditionalists as human beings. They fight for the church and what they believe in, in personal holiness. To that extent, it doesn't help when progressives mock tra traditionalists. It may be a natural reaction to the pain and hurt people feel from not being heard or agreed with, but it doesn't build relationships. Being respectful of people with whom you disagree is at the heart of Christianity. Progressives also need to have compassion, just as much as traditionalists do. Compassion requires patience, and patience requires time. Just as Jesus took time to write on the ground, it takes time for the church to change. Jesus calls us to love our enemies and pray for them. Now, if we're, to call, if we're to pray for our enemies, how much more should we pray for our fellow Christians? It helps the church and ourselves when we pray for their well-being. And if that seems difficult, pray that you can see them as God sees them. Be sensitive to the humanity of others in the church. Know that the work of the General Conference has to include all areas of the globe, not just the United States. Some changes to the UMC stance on LGBTQ matters uh, may seem paltry to the progressives in the United States, but they're huge uh, overseas where LGBTQ people are routinely persecuted and imprisoned for their identity. 
Know that what you say has an impact. Prophecy must come from a place of love. Words are like stones. They may help bring out a certain justice in the long run, but not without hurting people in the process. We need to discern carefully who are our neighbors. Our neighbors are on both sides of the aisle, not just the ones who wear the same colors or sing the same chants. The bridge between the LGBTQ community and the rest of the church is one that's full of potholes, speed bumps, and loose gravel. That's because the people of the church are not perfect. We never have been. But first and foremost, we must never forget we are dealing with people. We must never lose our focus on Jesus Christ. May God help us continue this journey together. Amen.